You can see it. I was still. Okay. All right, starting now. Morning, Justin and Cass. We give a few couple more minutes just for people to join. Hi, everyone. Hi, Pete. Hi, Justin, and welcome everyone that's jumping in the room. Give us a countdown when you want to start, Justin. There, there still seems to be people um, uh, coming in, so maybe give it, give it another minute. No worries. couple of people just popping into um, the Q&A there, one, two, oh, five, four, three, two, one, go, and hello, so hello back, and we will be launching shortly. I think I might do a bit of juggling, do you think? As long as it's not with sharp objects, you're good to go. All right. Shall we give it a crack? Uh, yes, I think so. We're good to go. Okay. Lots well, of people uh, saying hello. Hello, everyone. I've got someone saying you've got no sound. Uh, if that's a common problem, can you put your wing up? But I think it might just be a personal problem. Yep, Paula, Paula just said sounds good. So I think we're going through okay. Yeah, cool. All righty. Uh, I was like Peter Thorpe here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks to and thanks to Approval Max for uh, letting me be a part of this webinar and bring a topic of uh, of importance to the bookkeeping community. Uh, so to help us with today's discussion, we have uh, Cassandra Scott, Head of Bookkeeping, uh, APAC at um, uh, Approval Max, uh, Director and Senior Bookkeeper at Loris and 30 plus years experience in bookkeeping, office admin and business support services across various industries. Um, her significant experience makes her an ideal speaker for today's webinar. Also with us today, we have uh, we have Justin Campbell, 10 plus years experience uh, in accounting software and in industry experience, uh, originally as an accountant uh, with 10 plus years at zero. And uh, for and your host, uh, myself, Peter Thorpe, three years as an auditor with Deloitte's, uh, 30 plus years working as an accountant with small business clients and 20 plus years with the bookkeeping industry. I should be about 150, I reckon. Uh, and I'm your host for today. So on with the show. Um, any questions, um, if you could just please use the Q&A feature and not the chat feature. We've disabled it um, and we will endeavour to uh, tap a couple off along the way and uh, stockpile some for the back end and time permitting, we'll get through as many of those questions as you have. Um, so to get into the, into the topic, we have um, what are internal financial controls so let's just start with uh, with some of the basics um what what are financial controls 
look, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I started my life, uh, my early working life as a, as a fresh faced auditor for Deloitte. Uh, so I had internal controls and their importance drummed into me. Uh, they are an important part of what big companies build into systems to minimize errors and fraud. That's what we as auditors went looking for. We, we checked to make sure that those financial controls were in place. Um, but it's important to note that these internal financial controls, they're not the domain of uh, the big public companies alone. They, they apply to all businesses that have financial dealings, uh, big and small. Uh, look, a little bit later on in my working career, I got into the small business accounting world where uh, small uh, business teams, uh, yeah, they were small, they, they were smaller, uh, they had less ability to, to split their, their personnel around. And look, I saw firsthand what can, can go wrong in a small business that has poor internal controls. Uh, bad decisions were made, you know, poor resource management, look, even fraud. Uh, and, and from my working life, what I can tell you is it's a, it's a little bit more common than you might think. Um, look, Cass, I was just going to uh, lean on you if I could. Can you um, can I ask you to lead off with your thoughts on financial controls? Yeah, Pete. Look, um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, picking up on your comment about that there's a perception that internal financial controls are the, the domain of big business. Um, I think that's absolutely far from the truth. And, and one of the things that small businesses and particularly a lot of the businesses that we work with as, as practitioners really do need to focus on. Um, but unfortunately, they are often not considered in the day-to-day -day processes and often because a business sort of starts really organically with, with perhaps just one or two people within the business, the, the owners of the business doing everything. And as they slowly grow, they, um, they, they don't consider financial controls as part of the business growth. But what we're talking about with internal financial controls is really just a, a subset of a much larger group of functions within a business around safeguarding financial resources. And there's a number of different moving parts and moving, moving elements to that. Some of the simplest are, are actually segregation of duties and job rotation. So if you're looking at two people being involved in, in payment processes, it means that one person doesn't have control of, of the totality of, of financial functions within the business. And this is even applicable to small, you know, husband and wife businesses. There's no reason why that can't be imposed and, and applied in those circumstances as well. Things like authorizations and approvals, you know, who within a business should be approving expenditure within a business? Is that expenditure in, occurring against budget lines? Um, are there, there financial limitations around those levels of expenditure? Uh, what's the process for having those approvals for expenditure in place? Um, Aside from the, those sorts of things, we're also looking at the security of records and data. And when we talk about that, we're talking about not just physical records. Um, we're now uh, quite significantly talking about the security of our digital uh, data and our digital assets, because, you know, as we'll, and we'll touch on it a little bit later, uh, that's a, a prime um, piece of, of infrastructure that is often targeted by those that are looking to commit fraud within a business, either externally or in, internally. Um, regular internal audits, and this is one of the, those really interesting ones where, um, you know, if you're working with external service providers, accountants and bookkeepers or BAS agents, uh, the businesses can utilise those people in their capacity to actually just run some internal audits. Sometimes there's a little bit of a gut or a bit of a sniff test there. If you think it's something's not quite right, get somebody in to have a look at it. Don't just assume that the, the nice person that you've employed to be your, your internal accounts payables person is actually doing the right thing. Um, because I think one of the biggest things that, that people need to be aware of and understand is that most breaches in financial controls or fraud are actually undertaken by somebody within your organisation, not external to your organisation. There's a, a significant um, piece of work too around training and education. So working with your staff internally to, to understand where the, um, the points of risk actually are and what needs to be done within a business to maintain internal financial controls. And there's also significant links in with um, cybersecurity and IT security as well and ensuring that your, your digital systems are as secure as they possibly can and that 
the right people have the right access to the right data at the right time. And, you know, there's a lot of bookkeepers on the call today and, you know, often we'll go into client systems and see that every man and his dog has complete and unfettered access to the client's financial data. So all of those combined start to form the baseline for internal financial controls. And you can actually develop and, and evolve those um, depending on the size and the structure of business um, using different tools that are available to you. It's all good points, isn't it? And um, as you say, small business, a lot of them don't understand uh, these issues. I think we had a true story had an employee join us not so long ago from somewhere else and um, they thought they had access to their employee um, uh, portal <laughs> for information on pay and leave and stuff, but they had full access to their general ledger. Um, just <laughs> scary stuff. Um, yeah. Was, uh, to bring a, like a practical perspective to uh, financial controls, can you give our listeners just a bit of insight into risk assessment and from a, like an approval max uh, point of view, uh, the controls that prevent, detect and correct? Yeah, did you want to, um, me to talk around that one, Pete, or Justin to jump in in the first instance? Going to fire up his computer, I think, but if you want to lead off, Cass. Yeah. Um, Look, I think um, assessing risk is something that we all need to do. And, you know, when you assess risk in, in a business, you're looking at it from two aspects. You, you're looking at the probability of something actually occurring. And then you're also looking at the impact of that that's occurring. And often if you're, you're developing a risk matrix profile for any type of circumstance, you've, you've got both of those and, you know, low risk, low, low potential or, or low um, impact is, is green. But as you sort of move through, you get higher risk, higher um, probability and you, you get into the red. And they're certainly the areas that I would like to see people focus on in their, their business. But when you're looking at your risks, what are you looking at? You, you're looking at reducing the opportunity. And as I said earlier, you know, a lot of our clients clients um, give unfettered access. And I think we've all had those conversations with clients where the first thing they say is, that's all right, Dale, I'll give you the access to my, my banking. Here's all of my internet banking credentials. And often that will give you access to not only their business bank accounts, but their personal bank accounts and any other bank accounts that are hooked up, which just means they're absolutely ripe for picking. Um, so, you know, having those conversations with clients and, and making sure they understand how to reduce that opportunity. Where are the gaps in processes? So, you know, looking at um, who's got access to, to different functions and, and um, opportunities to uh, spend money within a business. And that can be similar, simple things by, you know, assessing who's got the, the Bunnings Power Pass card or the Fuel card. And again, these are things that we see regularly within our businesses and particularly we've got clients that will say oh my god I'm, you know we're losing so much money our fuel bill is so high but they're actually not going back to the root cause and identifying who's actually got the 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 cards or um, the ability to spend money on the business um, behalf um, you know what's the impact of the risk if somebody has access to your bank account and has the ability to clean it out that's a pretty significant risk and that's a pretty significant impact on your business or on your client's business. So when we're talking about this, this isn't just about your clients, this is about your businesses as well. And, you know, having a cleaned out bank account is in many instances, catastrophic. Um, it is something that a business cannot and will not recover from. Uh, so again, assessing who has access to that. Um, you know, timelines of review as well. So one of the things that, again, as bookkeepers, we often see is the ability to track down something that's that's been spent within a business um, doesn't necessarily happen immediately. Now, that's, that's changing and has changed significantly over the years with, you know, web-based accounting systems and web-based tools that are, that are in play, that we're seeing the transactional information uh, much earlier in the, the, the bookkeeping cycle. And then we're able to sort of jump on it in action, the, you know, have you got the tax invoices, who approved this, all of those sorts of things. So narrow down the timeline between when the expense is in, in, being incurred and when you're actually sort of referring it and recording it in your accounting system. Now, while that's happening retrospectively, and you would hope that there are processes in place before those expenses occur, identification of fraud 
um, by shortening that timeline is is actually paramount. And you know, we can we can correlate that with our own examples. That if you've had a credit card that's had um, a, a fraudulent transaction on it, if you can see your, it in your accounting system, or you're working with a bank that notifies you of, of unusual transactions, jumping on and dealing with it almost immediately or within that 24 to 48 hour window is actually going to minimise the exposure that you've got. So it's understanding these things as well. Yeah. Um, I think one of the other interesting things that we need to factor in when we're talking about assessing your risks is also the language that's often included in um, things like your management insurance and your cyber insurance disclosures. Um, and the reason I highlight that is because I think they're actually often a pointer to areas in your business that are asking you questions about you know, what are your financial controls? I know when I've filled out my um, disclosure documents, they're asking me questions about, do you have two people involved in the payment procurement process? How are the separation of duties actioned within your practice? Who has access to your bank accounts? Who has access to your financial systems? So even if you don't know where to start, actually looking at the questions you're being asked on those documents is a really, really good place um, to begin. And if you can answer those questions um, for your insurance providers, then you're stepping well and truly into, um, you know, the controls around um, the risks that you've got there. Um, so that's where I would start with assessing your risk is looking at all of the aspects within your business or your clients' businesses and, and start to see where the potential gaps are. Yes, yeah, that's they're all good points, um, uh, Cass. Uh, look, it's 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 it never ceases to amaze me how long um, a fraud can go on. Uh, you you look at it and you think like you hear them report and you go, well, that's been going for eighteen months. And you think how could that possibly happen? Uh, and so often it's because the person uh, the perpetrator is often seemingly the most trusted human being in the place. Mm -hmm. um, they, they bleed on that trust. Uh, they can make up excuses and keep the balls up in the air uh, for quite a while uh, until eventually the well one <laughs> runs dry and um, the proverbial hits the fan. So it is, it is it is staggering how it is, how long it can go on. And as you said, uh, monitor uh, monitoring bank accounts and stuff a little more closely. You know, you, you've got a certain time frame to pull certain things back. Um, mm. but you can wait eighteen months. Um, yeah. To, to give you, just... to give you a story on that. Um, there was a um I, I read in the Courier Mail there was a case out in Ipswich of a um of a fishing magazine where where a trusted employee um had been um steal you know stealing from the business over over a number of years and and the end result of that was that they ended up having to let go half their staff and actually their um but their bills to their suppliers and also to the tax office hadn't been paid in quite a long time. So not only were they stolen from, but they also found out that all of this money that they thought was getting paid to suppliers and the tax office and things wasn't wasn't getting paid. And and the directors of the company were um were earning sort of less than minimum wage because they're having to pay back this huge amount, huge amount of debt that they owed and the truth is is um if you read even your local paper um you know the local um papers you can you can find stories like this in the court section you know almost week weekly where um, there's devastating consequences of yeah. relatively small businesses not having um robust financial controls yeah, yeah. I mean and when we're talking about financial, we don't exclude the payroll side of it as well. So often we, we talk about um, financial controls being purely about the accounts payables process and, um, you know, mispayment or incorrect payment or diversion of funds. But um, financial theft is, is also around payroll, somebody taking more leave than they're entitled to, somebody not recording leave that um, they have taken. Uh, so don't just uh, don't just look at the accounts payable side. Have a look at your payroll systems as well, and the approvals and processes that are in there. Um, and I say that because I found out only uh, probably a couple of months ago that one of my ex bookkeepers, and when I say ex, probably about eight nine years ago, was actually um, before the courts for um, committing payroll fraud within a, a business that they then went on and 
worked with. So that was um, that was rather interesting to see it. Um, so it, it it's it's out there and it's people that you know. It's people within your businesses, and I think if we look at it, every single one of us will have had some contact either if not directly then you know one or two people removed where they have either been the victims of the perpetrators of or significantly impacted by um financial fraud i'm gonna keep moving along uh, justin you um we're gonna give us a little bit of a um a, an approval max uh a screenshot or, or two in this particular area yes 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 that's right um okay so i'll share my screen now so, um, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, creating controls that prevent, detect and correct. So, so really like having, having a good process in place um, is really, is really important. And, and what Approval Max really allows you to do is to allow you to almost automate these processes because, because it, it um, you you start you start create a bill or a purchase orders and then it'll follow a set of rules and get central to all the right peoples and you know and then an audit trail will be created so we could create um we can create approval workflows for um you're all seeing my screen right better double check that mm -hmm. thumbs up yep all good <laughs> okay um for purchase orders bills um, credit notes on both the sales and purchases side. Uh, we also do batch payments as well. And um, and we've just released in Australia and New Zealand Air Wallets batch payments as well, which gives you really good protections around what you're paying in the batch. For example, um, I'll just switch to the screen here. We can actually, um, uh, when we do a batch payment through Air Wallets, we can... Um, we can let you know whether or not that bank account has been paid before or whether it's been changed since the last time that it, that it's been done or if it's the first time it's it um it's being done so we're running we're running a check on those to detect potential uh fraud and because you know that can happen both internally or externally um internally it's you know an employee who's given the wrong um uh, details but externally sometimes you can get an email come in and says oh yeah we've changed our bank account please pay us pay to this bank account now and and um and that will um and, and the integration we have will flag flag if the detail the details have changed um so but if i go into the bill workflow um it's really simple to really sim simple to build in these controls for example uh, Cassandra was talking about um, the importance of sort of protecting your financial information. One of the benefits of Approval Max is that is that people who are creating bills or doing approvals don't even need access to the underlying um, zero or or QuickBooks Online file. So, and when you give them access, you've got a lot of control over what they can do and see. So you can go into our request a matrix and choose, for example, whether they're allowed to add new contacts or not, or um, you can make, you can choose what accounts they can pick from and um, make certain um, like, for example, tracking categories, mandatory. So you've got a, you've got a real lot of control um, in here. Uh, the other thing you can do is we integrate with Dex prepare. So, you could go from entering things via Dext and then, um, and then running it to um, running it to your next approval. So what a lot of bookkeeping practices do is that they they have the first approver be be one of their own um, staff members to review things as they come from Dext or HubDoc or or whatever, and then and then it would then go to the client, and then you'd build your um, uh, your rules around who and the who and the client needs to approve it, um, and then then you know that not only have you approved it, but also the client has approved it, and then the end result is what ends up in either zero or QuickBooks Online. You can have real faith that that has gone through a proper robust process, and and there's also an audit report attached to it that that um details that details that process so um it's really easy to talk about things like segregation of duties or separation of duties um and and like um 
vacation le vacation leave policies and things like that. But in practice, with small business accounting software, um, it, it's it's hard to implement because the mentality of small business accounting software is still really, um, excuse the pun, but like the manage your own, mind your own business um, approach, which kind of assumes that the sole you, the sole proprietor is doing all the invoicing and, and and all of that. So, and there's not really those approvals or those checks built in built into those systems. So, there's just one last thing I want to show before we move on, which is goes to um, Cass's point about um, job rotation and vacation leave in Approval Max. Um, it's really easy when someone goes on leave to delegate their responsibilities. So if someone, when someone goes on leave, rather than, rather than have them say, oh yeah, I can still log in and approve the bills. Um, you can, it's best practice to actually get someone else to do that. And then, um, and, and approval makes, makes it really easy just to pick the person and then pick the date range that you want to, uh, that you want to delegate those responsibilities. Mm. Okay. There's so, a really important red flag there too, Justin, that if you've got an employee mm. in a business that doesn't take leave and every time you suggest they take leave says, this place can't run without me, I'm the only person that could do that, I would see that as a significant red flag within a business and I would wonder why uh, they're not wanting to allow anybody else to access the financial information of the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That That's a really, that, that's a really good, good point there, yes. It revolves around keeping all the all the balls up in the air, and uh, you don't need other eyes in it if you're running that sort mm. of, uh, so to speak. Uh, listen, guys, I was down at uh, ZeroCon not so long ago. Um, uh, no, ZeroCon next year, by the way. But fear not, uh, ABN conference will be there in the void. So uh, make sure you get to Adelaide. That was a pre, pre ad for us. Um, look, I was at ZeroCon. I saw the Approval Max ran a financial controls test. Um, and um, you guys shared some of the results with me uh, not so long ago. Uh, and I had some sort of results that I would think are somewhat disturbing around internal controls or financial controls. Justin, do you want to share with the listeners and, and, and maybe give listeners a chance to you know, even take the test themselves? Or can you give us a bit of a bit of an insight into that test and what it sort of showed us? Yeah, absolutely. So at the end, we'll be um, bringing up the, the details so people can take the test, but we can talk about the... Um, test results so far. So what we found um, is 70% uh, of people who took the test, and keep in mind, this is zero con as well. Like this is like, these are like the most like, um, you know, advanced, um, advanced users of accounting software in the country. Um, so 70% um, uh, don't use automation to detect um, AP fraud. 70% uh, do not use automation to tell the person making payments if goods or services have been received. So they don't have like, for example, a goods receive note um, functionality. 70% um, do not use automation to screen, verify and approve supplies to ensure they're legitimate. So that, um, you know, they're just letting people add in new vendors to their, to their accounting software. Um, 57% do not create purchase orders to use bill to purchase order um, payments are correct. So um, for, that, that's not even a feature that's supported in, in zero. So um, uh, so there, there's no way, there's no process going on matching the bill to purchase order. And 52% do not have a, um, a DFA um, matrix outlining the maximum limit for each decision maker approval um, uh, so that's um, uh, um, deferred delegated um, financial authority. Delegated <laughs> financial authority. Delegated yeah. financial authority. Yeah. yeah. So so that and uh, yeah. So and then fifty two percent do not have approval automation that allows multi step multi approval scenario. So like like I kind of mentioned before, it's very easy to talk about separation of duties, but um, if you kind of the tools you have don't make that easy to do then it's probably not going to happen mm. yep. i think they're interesting um results justin particularly for me the ones that stand out are at, um you know not using automation to screen verify and approve suppliers in a, a 
ensure they're legitimate. Um, not using automation to, to tell the person if good and goods and services have been received. Those two we just see commonly within businesses. Um, you don't know who the suppliers are, something will come into a business. Uh, you might even get a couple of high pressure phone calls from the supplier saying, you know, you've got my bill, when is it going to be paid? And often business owners will react to the urgency of those sorts of things and then just go ahead and pay it without necessarily checking the legitimacy of it. And we often see that with um, the reminder notices for ASIC renewal that don't come from ASIC, the, oh my goodness, you've advertised in the Rural Fire um, um, Services magazine and why haven't you paid those bills? So they're really, really simple things. And look, they're low value, but the accumulation of them really has and can have a financial impact on, on the business. And just simple checks and balances. And we talk about automation and Approval Max sits beautifully in this space for the, um, the, the digital automation. But you can actually bring those into the business in a very simple, you know, manual process if you need. Before you add a supplier in, check their legitimate against the ABR give the supplier a call from an independently verifiable source that their banking details are correct. If it's not a supplier that you've seen before and you're not sure about the services, speak to somebody in the business. Don't just assume because there's pressure being applied to pay a bill that it's actually a bill that needs to be paid. So there, there's some that are really, really simple to jump onto even without automation tools being in place. Yeah, look, and, and you mentioned you know, some of those can be annoying smaller amounts and they all add up, um, but they can be bigger ones. You know, think about the construction industry. Mm. Now, payments can be in the tens of thousands of dollars and if the system is slack um, and a number of those uh, controls you got mentioned there, uh, they could result in a large um, uh, you know, payment to a subby where they're yeah. looking at low margins. Um, one subby badly paid or paid to a crook is going to um, impact your profitability big time. I've got to keep moving um, I'm going to talk about systems uh, and having, the, I think Cash, you mentioned earlier about having uh, the right people having access to systems and, and financial resources. Uh, question for you, uh, how do you ensure that the right people have access to systems and financial resources? Yeah, well, I think you've got to assess the role that the, the individuals are playing within the organisation. Um, who needs to be doing what and where does the authority lie? I think one of the interesting things that needs to be um, mentioned and brought into this conversation is the role of outsourced and offshore teams in the financial payment process. And, and I do see occasionally in businesses that whilst the, the business itself thinks they have really tight financial um, controls and systems and processes, they neglect the consideration of any um, external service providers as part of that. Uh, so I think there's value in, in when you're, you know, we were talking about the risk assessment earlier. Um, Factoring that in is one of the, the, the points of risk that you need to look at. You know, what are your external service providers doing? What access to the systems do they have? Um, particularly also around digital and cyber security, that's a consideration I think that needs to be significantly in play. Um, so yeah, who needs to perform the roles within the business without compromising the business workflow? You certainly don't wanna build um, approvals processes that actually grind the business to a halt. Um, so you don't wanna overcomplicate it, but you wanna make sure that the right person is um, actioning the right approval at the right point in time. Um, and again, this is where Approval Max does sit nicely in there because it has a really nice workflow around, um, around that. And, you know, you can even be sitting at the couch at night on your app doing some of those approvals. I know a client I worked with a while ago and we were doing some of those. Um, it was easy just to sort of sit there and do it after hours on an, on an app with all of the information that was available. Um, you know, if you're you're not sure within the business who's undertaking those roles, I think that needs to be a point of clarity. And even with the small mum and dad businesses. So one of the things that we often see is that people become really um, reactive to, to bill payments. So, oh my God, the bill's in, I've got to pay it today. Um, where realistically, you've got protocols that you can put in place around supplier terms of trade and your own business's terms of trade. And you can leverage off of your, your accounting system to do this. Um, one of the things I would say is that anybody that's that's doing this needs to slow down sometimes and actually take a breath before stepping into the payment process. And what I mean by that is don't react to the urgency of, of other people. Um, pick a day of the week that's going to be your, your payables day if you're, you know, just a small business. Um, 
when you do that, what are your processes? What are your checks and balances? What systems do you need access to? Who do you need to then liaise with to upload the payment? Often as bookkeepers, we're asked to prepare payment batches for our, our own clients. You know, what is the process and protocol that is in place with our clients around the approval of the bills before they, they get to the payment batch? The bills that need to be included into the payment batch you know, are we uploading to the bank? Are we releasing from the bank or is the client releasing? So all of those things need to be considered. It's it's not an arduous process to map that out. You've just got to commit to actually doing it um, and understanding what your system's capacity and capabilities are in supporting you through that process as well. Um, Justin, if you've got something you can show listeners uh, from the Approval Max side of things, how they can assist with um, access to right people to, to the financial resources. Yeah, abs ab absolutely. So let me share my screen again. Um, so I, I did touch on this a little a little bit earlier, but um, but the re it really comes down to um, the your user roles and the fact that to be able to um to be able to create a um uh to be able to create a bill or a purchase order you can do it in approval max you can actually do it by both um the the web app and the mobile app on both apple and android um and and from an approver's point of view you can approve in um the web app the mobile app but also we have a um you can also do it from your inbox as well. Um, so an email email can be sent to an approver and they can approve or reject from their inbox. And um and also via Slack. So so to be an approver or a um to be an approver or a um uh or a or a requester, you don't need access to either QuickBooks Online or um or Zero. And um and like I, I was talking with a um, booking practice the other day and Cassandra was talking about um, offshoring before. So their, their process was that, was that um, their, their offshore resource um, w was entering in things in Dext and they were reviewing, reviewing, doing the first review in Dext. And then, and then it would come to their, one of their Australian team members in in approval in approval max to do to review it from that point so by the stage it it um, by this stage it's already been had two people reviewing it and we actually have in approval max for the first approver we also have the option of making someone a reviewer and and a reviewer is able to go in if you turn this feature on is able to go and change items tracking categories and accounts so they can um you can fix up sort of mistakes that perhaps the first person made at this stage um and then and then from that point on it was going to the client for the final review so so following that process it's actually had three people review it it's had the automation of using dext and then it's um had had three three people three people reviewing it before it finally gets pushed through to um zero as an uh, as an awaiting payment bill or quickbooks online as a um as an as an approved as an approved bill so that that's a really really big important value of um of of um approval max and how it protects your accounting data and you can do the same thing with batch payments as well so you can have have someone preparing a batch payment and then um uh, and then it going going through a multi-step multi-step approval process and again um that they wouldn't need um the only person who needs access to zero is the person who the, exports out the ABA file and sends the remittance advice mm. Yeah, we've yep. often heard stories about people, you know, concerned about the granularity of user access in in zero, as an example, mm. that sometimes to do some of the features that are, are business critical, they need to see how much is in the bank accounts, they need to, their credentials give them access to a bank account. And, you know, again, it's about opportunity. If somebody sees that you've got a bank account that's got a fair bit of cash in it, and then there's an opportunity to be a bad actor, um, 
again, it's about reviewing your risk and your profiles and those sorts of things. It, people don't always start out wanting to um, abuse financial privileges or controls within a business, but sometimes life and circumstance actually puts them in a position that they do that. Um, and if they've got the ability to do it, then it, it becomes a simple task for them. So yeah, this is where these approval matrices are um, incredibly valuable. Can, can I just touch on um, those people who do actually have access to the underlying um, uh, accounting org as well? We do have some built-in fraud detection as well. So once it's not the end, we, with approval max, it's not that we're just doing the approval, pushing it through to zero, and then once it gets to zero, we don't care anymore. Um, <laughs> you can actually turn on fraud detection. So, um, so there's two types of fraud detection that we do for zero for um for both zero and QuickBooks, is one, we can detect if someone's just going in a zero in authorizing authorizing bills, um authorizing bills bypassing your approval process and approval max, and and we can pull that bill into into approval max and notify your administrator, the administrator of your account that that your norm that your approval process has been bypassed the other thing we do is after something has been approved we can track all these fields here to see if any of the details are being are being changed so um so that way and, and there are some legitimate cases where people want to just go in and change something in zero rather than having to completely void it and and redo Re redo the um the whole thing but but um what what approval max gives you is a notification that that is happening you can see it in approval max it gives you a little explanation mark next to it when you do it and then whoever's made the changes should probably go into approval max and put in the comments area on a bill um so if we just get out of here and go into say approved bills um, there is this chat area here. So if you've gone and changed something and let's say this bill now has an explanation against it, warning that uh, and a big notice up here that it's been changed, you should probably leave a comment down here to explain why why that change was why that change was made. So uh, this this really gives a lot lot of um, protection against potential fraud. Yeah. Good point. Um, let's awesome. move along to uh, separation of duties. And um, Cass, you touched on it a little earlier. Uh, what's best practice in reducing employee fraud through separation of duties? Look, things I had drummed into me as a junior auditor went out in the field was separate, you know, make sure that there's been separation of both the recording of transactions and access to funds. I think we might've just touched on that earlier. Separate the authorization from the payment. Uh, and look, there's a lot of fraud in the small business community. And as I said earlier, more than people actually realize. And some of it never goes detected and some of it gets detected and swept under the carpet because people are embarrassed and what have you. But look, invariably small business that become the, the victims of fraud have not had these, uh, have not got separation of duties in, in any great substance. So I just want to start with Cass, if I could, for some commentary mm. on separation of duties. And maybe that if Justin, you've got something you want to show us on AM briefly, we're, we're going to, we don't want to run out of time here. But um, yes, anything that's going to help us with the re, with the minimization of employee fraud with that separation of um, duties and functions. Yeah, Pete, I think you've touched on it. The simplest one is the person that's entering the bill isn't paying the bill. Um, and to extend that a little bit per further, the person that's paying the bill and the person that's uh, entering the bill um, may not necessarily be the person that should be adding the bank account details into the system as well. So, you know, in Xero now, you've got the ability to lock down the um, the, the contacts banking details. Um, and we ensure with our, our team, for instance, that if you're processing the, the bill into Xero, then somebody else within our, our practice needs to update the contact uh, bank ad bank account details. Um, I think the other really, really important thing I'd like to stress around separation of duties is that owners can't abrogate their responsibility out to a third party. They need to be part of the process and they need to be part of the solution. Um, because if they can't take responsibility or be aware that this is a necessity in their business, then that they're, again, I come back to this word of risk, they're increasing the risk of something like this happening within their businesses. You know, they don't have to be complex, they just have to be in place, and they have to be adhered to, and not just sort of 
tokenize sort of oh yeah yeah that's what we're supposed to do but reality is we we do this instead it's the safest way to protect you your clients and their their financial um success and future basically from bad actors that that want to choose to um to do the wrong thing so yeah anything you want to show us there quickly justin yeah sure um yeah so um we've kind of already i've kind of already shown how easy it is to just do the segregation of duty part so um uh so what i might show is uh, the point cassandra was making around um, approval of contact so we actually have a contact approval workflow so you could um, uh, add people to be able to give people the permission to um, to be able to um, put in a request for a new contact and then have a process for approving the entry of that new new contact into um, into the accounting into the accounting system so that's um that that's a very powerful um protection and then mm. going back a step in the actual uh when you're doing a bill um in the requester matrix you can tick or untick this box so i would generally say that most users shouldn't have the ability to add a new contact to the system instead you should set up a contact approval workflow and have that as a separate workflow Mm. that the first step should be entering the new contact into the system and then you and then and then you would uh then then you enter the bill so um yeah that that is a really powerful um protection i'd also note in zero um you should sort of regularly have a look at the assurance dashboard as well and part of the assurance dashboard is is actually letting you know if bank details of contacts have been changed mm. So um, that that's another control you've got. Yeah, I've got to laugh, Justin. I've got a few clients that um, do some work with uh, state government departments and they're absolutely pedantic about um, making sure their contact records and their vendors are actually put through an approval process. But the irony of it is, is that the, the way they do it is by an editable PDF that they email out. So, <laughs> you know, whilst they're... <laughs> They're in theory ticking the boxes for, you know, checking contacts and, and things like that. It's still being done in a way that has um, exposure to being intercepted and, and risk associated with it. So, yay, go the government. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's hilarious. On a little bit. Um, a quick question, if you could share with listeners the importance of standardising format and structure of financial documents. Is that an issue that we ought to be concerned about? Um, yeah, look, I, I, one of the things is um, standardisation of documents. And, you know, I realise we're, we're pushing for a bit of time here, but um, making sure that, you know, the documents that you use within your business are standardised if they're going out to suppliers. Uh, but also be aware that if you're getting variable formats from your suppliers, that's potentially um, because somebody is trying to do something a little bit dodge. So just be aware of that. It's not an absolute. It's just something to be, be aware of. Certainly leverage off of the templates you've got in your accounting software. They're a standard format, a standard push out. That's pretty good. Um, things like sending your statements to customers, checking statements from suppliers, sending remittance advices to suppliers. These are all financial documents that in there individually mightn't detect fraud, but if you've got them as part of your process can actually highlight it occurring either on your end or um, on your supplier's end. And we've had that previously as well. Um, as I said before, don't try and be ad hoc about what you do. Pick a day of the week and block some time out. Um, and again, you know, we've touched on the ability of approval max to, to check for consistency of suppliers. Um, and the, and the cool thing I think about Approval Max is that it's not sort of separate from zero. It doesn't sort of take a heap of data and then feed it into zero. It actually works in parallel. Um, so it's not just syncing, it, it's working side by side with the data that's in your, your accounting software, um, zero and QBO. Um, and, you know, no one of the things that we've talked about is going to be the silver bullet to solve the problem. But the more you can utilise a combination of, of different financial controls, financial approvals, um, systems automation, you significantly reduce the risk. I, I don't know that you'll ever be able to eliminate it, but it will reduce that risk significantly. I wouldn't, um, 
mind spending just a little bit of time on the legal insurance uh, and obligations, things around duty of care. Um, so look, uh, there, there are a number of implications here. Uh, and um, you know, the first one that comes to mind is the uh, code of conduct. So there's a few code items that could be um, impacted with your role as a BAS agent, especially if you're honing in on, on a payables role. So um, you know, code item four tells you you have to act in the best interest of your client. You, you, know, you must act lawfully and in the best interest. So um, if, uh, if you are aware of poor controls and you say nothing, have you acted in the best interest? I don't know. I, I probably want to make sure I had uh, at least raised with clients and, and, and made some efforts to, to rectify these things. Also, uh, code item nine, you must take reasonable care and ascertain the client's state of affairs in the, to the extent it's, um, uh, it, it's necessary that the, the, in, uh, in uh, ascertaining client state affairs is relevant to the thing that you're doing on behalf of the client. So um, ignoring some of these things and not having decent controls in, I, I think you might be exposing yourself in, in, the, in, in the case of something going badly wrong to both items, code item four and nine. And don't forget, you've got a contractual obligation in your engagement letter. If you say you're going to offer a competent payables um, uh, a service, um, it's got to be a competent, payable service, a competent payable service. And I would think that would be uh, commentary and ownership to a point um, of, of, of financial controls and an, an implied obligation to bring it to your client's attention if there are weaknesses. So I think they're important uh, issues. Uh, from a PI perspective, um, our PI insurers tell us that impersonation scams, which you know this uh, decent controls hopes to to, to remedy or, or detect early, they're an increasing uh, increasing issue. Um, so we need to be watching out for those things. And PI insurers have uh, in their conditions that, uh, and it's pretty like the old reasonable man test. You know, are you covered? Well, so long as you've acted reasonably. Now it, it's a very subjective thing, but if you've ignored uh, blatant poor financial controls and it ends up in uh, in tears for the client, you got you're going to have to just. Uh, you know, I would hate to be on that pointy end uh, with your PI insurer. So, look, there's some things there to to, to take this sort of stuff seriously. Um, Cass, you got any perspectives here? Yeah, I think insurance is a big one, Pete, and um, you know we've certainly been chatting about this, but. You know, when you're as a bookkeeper uh, or BAS agent um, completing your insurance documentation, um, you're needing to properly describe what's being done for the clients. Um, and again, you know, linking back even as a, a, a practice and, you know, your management insurance um, side of things, what are the processes and protocols that you've got in, in place? You can't just tick those and hope like hell that nothing happens um, because if something does happen you need to be able to demonstrate how you have and why you said yes to those things or, or made those statements in the policy and if, if it's found that you've um, been negligent in making those statements um, a your your policy is not going to be valid, um, but B, there are potential fallbacks against your code of conduct in that um, you've perhaps not acted with honesty and integrity in the in the, the work that you've been doing. So yeah, I think it's a significant um, thing that we need to be aware of as BAS agents with our insurances, but I think there's also a conversation to be had with clients about their insurances as well. If the client's slack, it's not our um, ticket to be equally slack. We've, we've got to be on it. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. Um, look, I need to uh, just touch base on, like, if you're looking to set up uh, an approval process, we talked about how important this is. Let's say you've got some of the bit that is a bit untidy. You want to set up an, an approval process that's going to mitigate improper practices, fraud, discrepancies, that sort of thing. Cass, you got any thoughts here that um, about setting up an approval process that's going to help this? Uh, look, I think, Pete, the simplest things is to map out the process in your business from the decision to... Um, to enter into a financial um, commitment, um, who who is involved in that process? What are the tools that are being used? Do you have things like corporate credit cards? Do you have uh, Bunnings cards? Do you have fuel cards? Assessing the risk of those. Now that you know what the risk is, what are the strategies that you need to put in place around those? And you know the number of times I've seen Bunnings cards handed out to employees with no internal um, documentation about 
use so that if an employee does abuse those sorts of, of cards, um, the business itself doesn't necessarily have any legal recourse against the employee because there was no policy in place to mandate the way that this, this tool, this financial tool needed to be used. So, you know, risk, who's got it? What are your approval processes? who is approving, who is paying, where is the separation of duties um, and where is the audit and the check and the, the, the cross balancing. So, you know, bookkeeping, as we all know, is debits and credits, um, financial approvals and financial reviews. They, there's two sides to it as well. You can't just have the, the payment and the processing without a review process in place at some point in that, that cycle. So yeah, just start to step through it on a client by client basis or within your own practice to begin with. And um, I think you, you've, you know, you've started to step into it really, really nicely. And Justin, thoughts here from a, an approval max perspective, you, you support um, the principles espoused by Cass there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is the whole point of our product really is to make implementing these sorts of things easy and and also documenting it so it's very easy once you've created your workflow to create like a pdf document that shows what all your rules are and and whatnot and then um uh, you know your your order report of all of your um approval processes gets attached to the transaction in the accounting software as well in addition to living in living in approval max so in terms of like demonstrating that you've done everything that you can um everything you can you're really you're you've really done a lot to cover yourself and then but probably more importantly you've done a lot to protect yourself from these things happening happening um in the first place so that's where the prevention's the best <laughs> the best thing in Thanks. rather than um yeah Mate, is, is it, it's your time to shine. I know you've been busting your proverbial ready to run a poll so I'm going to ask you to yes. fire up at Bookkeeper Radio, we love polls. We love uh, we love polls. We love magpies. Um, but yeah, uh, let her rip. And um, if people would like to um, react to uh, Justin's poll, um, okay, that up on the screen Sorry. as we. Sorry, I'm having trouble. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I had trouble finding it. <laughs> there we go. Poll has launched on your on your screen. Okay, I can see it. So question out there is, are you interested in learning more about how bookkeepers and their clients are using Approval Max? How are we going on the poll, Justin? Uh, we're, we've got about 30% who, um, who, who we, um, yes. How about we let it hold for a little bit longer and, and while that's happening, um, uh, any questions we want to um, deal with? I noticed the, the Q&A, um, we've been sniping along the way. Um, so whether anyone's got any additional ones. Um, Look, I'm going to ask one, um, which I uh, um, sort of in the back of my brain while we're while we're thinking about it. But uh, one question for Justin and or Cass: um, Who's the ideal customer for Approval Max? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that that's a good question. So the, I mean, the ideal customer is is really any business or organisation that that um, needs. Uh, that needs the, some sort of financial control. So I, I honestly think that one, once you sort of outgrow the point where where you have like a sole pro proprietor who um, who knows every detail of what's going on in their business, like once you have, you know, um, uh, you know, employees, multiple staff members, you really start to need more than what your small business software gives you in terms of that's really the point where you need to start thinking about financial controls and approval max is by far the easiest way to implement that in, in an organization. So um, there was a survey done in 2021. It was on invoice fraud and it found that um, the higher, the, 
the uh, the businesses most likely to fall victim to invoice fraud were the ones that had between five and nineteen employees. So um, so those those businesses um, are probably exactly like what I'll say that they've kind of outgrown the point where they know where they where there's a lot going on in those businesses now. So they can't really know everything. They actually need to have like formal processes in place. And then um um uh, and then you know the the larger businesses, as you mentioned earlier, Peter, that's they start doing these things. But I think there's a actually a really big gap there of like mm. small to medium sized businesses that should have financial controls and simply don't. I would even go as far to say, Justin, is as soon as a business is bringing in a third person, so let's assume we've got mum and dad or just, you know, a, a sole proprietor, the minute that there is an external party engaged either as an employee or as a contractor to um, be involved in the payments process, I think that's the time when, you know, the approvals pathways need to be considered significantly and unfortunately that's one of the areas that you know businesses that are starting to expand don't consider as as being a priority but I I would go you know the minute there's an external third party that's a great tipping point or or to take that from a slightly different angle if you're the external party you need this if we if we look at it you know uh, for your indemnity and all of that yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the, you you want to be able to demonstrate that the client signed off on signed off on that bill being approved and that batch payment getting done or that credit note getting processed and and so uh, approval max really really gives you a really great way to to make that happen really seamlessly. A good observation there from Simone, uh, uh, Justin, uh, that, you know, software application, you know, the approval max application for sporting clubs and, uh, you know, social clubs and the like, um, they, they ought to be involved because, again, you've got a lot of people uh, working in a bit of a voluntary capacity and um, a lot of sophisticated users in, in many cases, I might stand corrected, but the processes um, then survive people changing uh, roles and what have you. That the checks and balance are in place. So they're probably an ideal customer. So we're probably out of time. Yeah. Uh, uh, you got any burning questions that you want to, uh, that you've picked up, Cass? Um, if, if not. Uh, no, look, I think we've answered everything that's come through, Pete. So, and certainly I pick up on Simone's comment. Um, not for profits are um, a really great market for approval, Max, particularly with board approvals and things like that. So if you're working with a not for profit, um, and you've got challenges with approving um, expenditure uh, because there's, you know, more than one signatory or you've got multiple board members that need to be involved or subcommittees, um, I would certainly consider this as a solution. I've got one question. I, this is my question, not from anyone else. Um, impersonation scams are a big deal out there. Um, approval max used properly um, should neutralise um, impersonation scams, yes or no, Justin? Or Cass, I don't care. Um, yes, I think 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 it would because um, it it gives you a um, a, it, what it does is it puts the approval of that particular bill um, in front of the right person in the business to actually be able to um, uh, by, like do the sniff test: is this legit or not? Um, so you know if you're Let's say you're um you're in the finance capacity or the bookkeeper, you you you're not necessarily in a position to know, but the person who's the the manager for that particular part of the business or something, um, do so um it's going to have a much better sense whether yeah. or not that bill is legit or not. I don't think we'll ever eliminate it 100%, Pete, um, because there's humans involved in the process. There's two sides. There's humans involved in the process and the tech is becoming a lot more sophisticated around those impersonation um, scams. But with with humans involved, you know, this will um, certainly go a significant way to mitigating risk. Um, But if you've got, you know, two or three people that are collaborating in a situation where fraud is being undertaken then you know again you're not dealing necessarily with the complete human side of it but it significantly improves the processes 
Look, that uh, essentially brings us to a close. Thanks, Cass. Thanks, Justin. Most useful. Um, bit opening in some of those places. Um, for those of you coming to QuickBooks Connect later in the week, come and say hello to Justin, the Approval Max team. Uh, also, the ABN team will be in residence. Myself, Kelvin, and Kelly. Uh, please come and say hello to us as well. Uh, we need friends. Uh, and look, thanks everyone for your attendance today. Uh, I hope you took some useful tips away, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. See you, everyone.